So welcome everyone. Yeah, Thank wonderful. you for coming to hear David Dotson. I've, I've known David for a long time. Um, before uh, coming to, as you have all heard, he is a, a Yaley. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what that guy is. I know. I mean, I you stand know, accused. I have a fond memory of Yale. I was there myself for a while. Right. Not, I not know. fortunately, not, unfortunately, I know. not as an undergraduate. I know. But I was at another place where I was fortunately an undergraduate, namely Chapel Hill. Right. <laughs> in any event, um, uh, David has had a long and distinguished career in philanthropy. Uh, he, is, he was the head of the Cummins Engine Foundation. Uh, you all may, some of you may know Erwin Miller. Who was, whose picture was on, I think, Esquire as being the man who should be president. How we miss wow. people like that, I'll never know. But in any event, um, Erwin Miller was a really extraordinary guy who founded the Cummins Engine um, Company. Uh, and uh, David was the d director of the foundation, the Cummins Engine Foundation, and also the um, vice president for, of Cummins Engine for corporate social responsibility, right? Um, uh, he was recruited to MDC, as those of you who are at MDC know, in, 19, uh, in 1987, um, uh, George Autry was then the president of, of, of MDC. For those of you who don't know MDC, MDC is an outgro outgrowth of the North Carolina Fund. The North Carolina Fund was, uh, is thought to be, and I think probably was, the first statewide anti-poverty program in the country during the Lyndon Johnson administration. When Terry Sanford was governor of North Carolina, uh, and he decided that North Carolina should create an anti-poverty program just for itself, and the the genius of Terry Sanford was, I'm going to create the North Carolina Fund. It's going to last for five years, and after that, it's going to go out of business. And if it started things that make a difference, they could continue if they wanted to, right? Yes. Um, so the, the North Carolina Fund did a number of things, of which MDC is one of them. But the one that, the, I think the only one that exists in any form, only descendant of the North Carolina Fund is MDC, as far as I know. And MDC stands for Manpower Development Corporation. Uh, and George Autry got, did a great job in leading it. David came as his deputy. And when, and when da George Autry died, David took over in, in, in 1999, the running of MDC. Uh, and it became very quickly one of the leading nonprofit organizations in the country that specialized in manpower development, manpower strengthening all over the South. And I don't know whether you did things outside the South, but, but certainly that in any event. Uh, and he's run MDC until now. Uh, and when he decided to retire, it struck me that this would be a great opportunity for those of us who've admired him for a long time and those of you who know him and know of him to honor him and get some parting wisdom from him after having <laughs> been the head of MDC for ever since 1999. So that's now, um, if I calculate correctly, 20 years. It is. Right. right. <laughs> that's a nice tenure. Uh, um, so uh, beyond that, he's been active nationally in the nonprofit sector, in foundations. Uh, he's on the board of the Mary, Mary Rose Babcock Foundation. Not anymore. I didn't say that was. I oh, said was. Was, he was. Was on the board. Happily on the Mary, board. Mary Reynolds Babcock <laughs> Foundation. He's also, a, he is, I think, still a member of the Public Welfare yes. Foundation. And, and is there another, you're on the, another foundation board? A local foundation. Local foundation. Yes. Uh -huh. His new project, as those of you who have talked with him or worked with him know, is Passing Gear Philanthropy. And he's decided to create an institute here, based here, but working throughout the South on passing gear philanthropy, the purpose of which is to help work with foundations and f enable foundations to figure out how to change themselves for the better. So far, so good? So far, so good. Okay. Well, that's about all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's pretty and good. <laughs> I, and, and if I've gotten been good so far, then I'm very happy about it. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to, to present to you David Dodson, a distinguished well citizen of North Carolina and a distinguished human being to, oh, known to many night. people for such. Well, thank you. It's lovely. Um, I'm really happy you're all, well, thanks, thank but thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted that you're here, and I'm also terrified that some of you are here because you work with me, and as I told my board member, now I'm either forced to tell the truth or not tell the truth, and whatever 
um, I'm going to be trapped. So I'm going to tell a good story, I hope. What I want to talk with you about today is a dimension of MDC's work that connects with um, foundation effectiveness. And it is this program we call, or strategy we call, Passing Gear Philanthropy, which is designed to address a major challenge. Quite simply, that challenge is that the South has enduring structural, social, and economic problems and inadequate philanthropy or social venture capital to deploy against those problems. And the Passing Gear Institute that Joel referenced that I'll describe toward the end of this is designed to inspire um, and prepare and focus more Southern philanthropy to use its resources and its influence, meaning monetary resources and social uh, influence, to find compelling and powerful ways to dismantle the barriers that stand in the way of this region being what it needs to be for the people who live here. That quite simply. Do I remember correctly that Paul Ilvesacher is the one who invented the term saying that philanthropy is society's passing gear? Oh my gosh. See, now this is why you don't want to have an encyclopedic <laughs> mind next to you. <laughs> So I didn't steal your thunder. You, you, well, you stole some slides. I don't know if that's the same thing. <laughs> Which I haven't seen. <laughs> Which you haven't seen. So I'm going to, the answer is yes. And so I'm going to be, able, I'm going to go through these. Because what I want to do here is, this is, this is unplanned humor, you know. What I want to do here is, is briefly state the problem. Briefly state why the notion of passing gear developed by Paul Ildesacker, along with and a, a parallel notion that small can be effective speaks to the kinds of strategies that we need in the South, where we don't have um, a lot of large foundations that are focused necessarily on structural problems, but we do have philanthropy. And the issue is, as someone once said in Alabama, how do we take what we have to make what we need to solve the problems that are facing us? So. Before Joel gives the rest of my talk, which he is very <laughs> capable of doing, just a little background. And you'll see, he's already done a good deal of this. So um, what is MDC? You've heard this. We're 50 plus years old. We were established by um, Terry Sanford's North Carolina Fund. And our mission there was to deal with poverty by equipping people for employment in a modern economy and building the systems necessary to do that readiness. So we were about poverty um, alleviation through building of systems that could work at scale to put people in a better place. I think what was significant about North Carolina's creation is we were a, an outgrowth of a passing gear philanthropy, the North Carolina Fund. And throughout our history, George Autry and and my tenure and, and my work with my colleagues, we have always believed that philanthropy can and should be enlisted as a key vehicle for problem solving in the region, particularly when um, non-political statement, uh, very often Southern government was insufficiently focused and engaged on issues of poverty and equity. So that's kind of a bit about MDC. And um, today, our mission is somewhat broader than our original one. Uh, our, our goal is to shape a South where all people thrive, modestly to state that. And what we do is work with institutions, leaders, and communities to do several things. Frame an action agenda. You see this at the bottom. We do that through publications like the one you have here. Mobilize leaders who say, we'd like to take those challenges on and help them figure what the agenda looks like in action. Design and demonstrate solutions. And much of our work that Mala and Julie and Joan and Kay and others do is what we call design build for foundations. A foundation will come to MDC and say, we see a problem. We have assets. How can you help us design and put in place a solution um, that will advance shared well-being in some way. So we're sort of a design-build firm for 
for social change in the South. And then when things catch on and work, we um, attempt to scale and sustain effective projects. And, and there are a lot of examples of that. Um, one, the North Carolina Rural Center, which has existed now here for 30 years, began as an idea that we actually helped design. We incubated it as its first staff. We built some of its programs, and now it is a self-sustained organization, much larger than we are, in fact. But it's an example of that agenda framing, incubating what doesn't exist, and putting infrastructure and leadership in place. So that's kind of what we do. And much of our work is supported by philanthropy. So a couple of years ago, here's the framing problem that so compelled us at MDC to figure out how to animate more of Southern philanthropy. It was said five years or so ago that the South has a third of U.S. poverty, a quarter of the U.S. population, and a sixth of U.S. foundation assets. In fact, the largest foundation in the South is about only one-ninth of the size of the Gates Foundation. So if you think about these challenges and our relative undercapitalization philanthropically, um, the question came to us is how do we get more of what we have, even though it is not adequate to the scale to focus on the, the number at the top, which is we have a great deal of entrenched poverty put in place by culture, by systems, by history, et cetera. The other thing um, that was discovered as we thought about the philanthropic landscape, we did a report, a State of the South report, um, now in two, uh, 12 years ago, two, thir 12, 13 years ago. And out of that emerged in an interview with a man named Jack Murrah, whom you may know, a, um, a quote that is engraved on our psyches. That's not a good image. But anyway, um, what, what Jack said, and, and Joan, my partner in crime, Joan Lipsitz, will remember this. He said, quite candidly and memorably, much of Southern philanthropy is hidebound, localized, and traditional. And I love this one. Too much Southern philanthropy is on cruise control. <laughs> so it, here we have these challenges. We have assets that are really being applied disproportionately toward the charitable relief of immediate need rather than the upstream causes of social problems. So we don't have enough philanthropy, and what we have isn't directed at the causes of challenges. And that seemed to us, as MDC, being concerned about the South, to be an opportunity to see if we could realign and animate philanthropy to work on the things that it could. So here's our focusing question in passing gear, and I'm intimidated because sitting there on the left, Joan Lipsitz was the co-architect with me of this strategy. Sitting next to her, Susan Wisely, is one of the thought leaders whose work informs how we do the work. So this is very frightening. Um, but I, um, uh, um, and they're threat, and you can see they're 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 scary too. <laughs> so um, I'm frightened, and they're scary. So um, here's the focusing question we asked ourselves, and this is what is behind the passing gear work we have done for the last 15 years, and that we now aspire to do in a more intensive and aggressive way through the institute. So here's the question. I, I, we should make this an open book question. Then maybe I could, we, can, we could see what people later, say. Later. <laughs> How can Southern philanthropy develop the mindset and methods that will enable it to become the social venture capital that our region so sorely needs? And that, that basically is what we're trying to figure out. Um, and we developed a methodology, Joan and I and other colleagues, to see how that can happen. Joel mentioned this, that Paul Ilvesacker, um, a, a um, legendary student philosopher of philanthropy, trustee of the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation for many years, um, coined the term uh, passing gear philanthropy in an article that he called Small Can Be Effective. And the title of my talk is Small Can Be Effective and Powerful Too. 
Paul believed that you did not have to be a mega foundation in terms of having um, immense amount of financial assets in order to have social impact. And in this article, he called out a number of foundations that with um, modest capital capability had produced significant social outcomes. In his day, writing in 1989, small was assets of $10 million or less. Things have changed. But I think we can take that image and say, much, much of Southern philanthropy is small by national standards. So this idea of small can be effective, I think, still applies as an idea for the South. Um, in, in the report, he also, or paper, he also um, lifted up uh, the term, as I said, passing gear. This is the quote that Joel just referenced. Um, and here it is. Social action is usually a slow process. Foundations, by stepping in, can speed up that process, acting as society's passing gear. Um, and in this paper, he called out the North Carolina Fund as an example of what was relatively modest investment by the Ford Foundation um, and uh, with the additional investment from Babcock and Z. Smith Reynolds uh, to develop a five-year campaign to work at the intersection of poverty and racism effectively to see how North Carolina could accelerate its progress. So it's, it's these two writings that gave MDC the sense that, my gosh, small can be effective. We've seen it in the example of the North Carolina Fund. And philanthropy can be a passing gear. There is a story that Tom Lambeth tells, maybe it's true, I hope it is, that, um, that Terry Sanford was once out on the campaign trail and he had been sharing great visions and a heckler or somebody in the back of the room was questioning him and then finally said, well, I, Mr. Sanford, I have a question. Um, I have a question. Do you believe in infant baptism? I hope this is true. And you know, what, this is a political gathering. What does infant baptism have to do with it? Terry Sanford said, oh, this is a trick, and came up with this response. Do you believe in, in infant baptism? Heck, he responded, I've even seen it done. <laughs> so, 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 the, 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 the it really, it, it, if, it, if it didn't happen, it, it, should, it should have happened. It's a true story. It's a true story. Um, I think the North Carolina Fund is an example that passing year philanthropy is within the realm of possibility. And that, and that philanthropically generated social change strategies are possible within our resource base. Um, so that's kind of where the nucleus of this work is. So the program of working directly with foundation staff and trustees in this methodology called Passing Gear Philanthropy seeks to do this. This is from this MDC report that you have in front of you. Um, in Passing Gear Philanthropy, we seek to engage society's inventiveness and focus its capabilities on situations where social performance is missing the mark and to cultivate will, imagination, and know-how to enable caring and concerned people to address the contradictions between the values we hold and the realities we face. Values like the American dream, values like society should work for everyone, and the reality of poverty, segregation, poor health. So that's what Passing Gear is, is trying to, to, to work on. And that's what our strategies, which I'm now going to share, um, a bit about come from. Before I do that, and this is a mind meld. Joel, Joel said, oh, well, Erwin Miller, for whom you work, was once on the cover of Esquire magazine. This is a picture of J. Irwin Miller. And um, I, I was very privileged right out of graduate school to go to work at the company that he led, Cummins Engine Company. Um, he was a humanist, a scholar, a brilliant businessman, a deeply religious person with a passion for 
addressing those contradictions between social ideas and social realities. Cummins was a, and is, a very, very strong industrial company. Mr. Miller said, we're going to run it first to make sure we do no social harm, and then once we've done that, we will be philanthropically generous. So first do no harm, then do good. That was his philosophy. And the doing good that happened through Cummins Engine Foundation was really remarkable for a corporation. Um, before I got to Cummins, the foundation was led by a man named Jim Joseph, who was for many years professor here, ambassador to South Africa, and a, um, as, as someone once said, a, um, a patriot and a rebel. It's a wonderful combination. And Jim Joseph had an acute social conscious, conscience and was very persuasive. He convinced Irwin Miller and the foundation. This is a company based in rural Indiana, Columbus, Indiana. the birthplace of our incumbent vice president, I might say. So it is, it is a, not a flaming radical city. <laughs> Erwin Miller was convinced by Jim Joseph and by his own deep religious convictions to be maybe the only Republican businessman to fund the Black Panther free breakfast program, mm -hmm. thereby being for certain the only Republican businessman from Indiana to end up on Nixon's enemies list because <laughs> of his philanthropy. I mean, this, is, this was the idea, my first job, that I saw that, that courageous application of philanthropy in the service of social justice right. was powerful and that power could get behind resources to achieve social ends. It was really inspiring. The best known outcome of Cummins Engine is this program which um, it, it, when faced with the fact that there weren't enough good public schools being built in Columbus, Erwin Miller who's um, college friend was a man named Eero Saarinen, the great architect, <laughs> said, why don't we address this problem by getting citizens to choose the best possible architects to build schools that will ennoble our community. So this was an example of taking a, a, a fairly mundane need and finding an inventive solution that would produce really distinctive social outcomes. So these are two of the seeds of, again, what could passing gear philanthropy look like that I happen to stumble into. And you may not want to do it now, but yeah. but he took, a, talk a little bit about what else he did in Columbus, Indiana. It wasn't just, the school started, but yeah. Oh, well, well, there are 80 buildings by eminent architects. I am Pei, um, Kevin Roche. It is the sixth greatest compendium or collection of modern architecture in the United States <laughs> in a city of 40,000. Buildings that are also functional and where the design happens as a result of citizens choosing architects to do civic design. It's a wonderful story and should be a, a case study in and of itself. But my, my exposure to Jim Joseph and Erwin Miller just reinforced the Ilva soccer belief. And then, and I'm so glad Mary is here, when a little time after coming to North Carolina, I was uh, invited to be a trustee of the Babcock Foundation, a, an exemplary passing gear institution whose impact on poverty, on field building and community development is so much greater than its asset base. These were the validating examples that said passing gear is in fact possible. So that's kind of background, and I think it's, it's important to say we have living examples of small amounts of capital. Neither Cummins or Mary Reynolds Babcock was philanthropy on steroids. These were relatively, I mean, we would all like to have, in the case of Mary Reynolds Babcock, $180 million, but it's not $40 billion. But amazing things can happen with judiciously and creatively applied small amounts of capital rooted to deal with um, equity issues. And that was the example when Joan and I said, well, how could we um, have more of this happen in the South? So again, this is what Passing Gear was about. And our methodology, which thanks to Joan's language, is best described 
as an assertively facilitated process of getting foundation staff and board to look at data, build an equity analysis, look under the hood of the car and figure out what capabilities they have to be passing gear and then putting together a strategy. That's what this methodology is about. And I think that's significant. Um, this isn't consulting, and meaning dropping a strategy on someone's um, a desk. Imagine you're foundation trustees, and we're going to walk through this in a minute. Imagine you are um, given compelling and disturbing data about the direction of your community, and then asked to, as Joan says, interview the data and ask why, 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 why. Then imagine that you're asked to look at your assets and influence and say, what can these do about this, and put together a strategy. That rarely happens over an extended period of time. This is sort of philanthropic boot camp um, for trustees and staff to actually engage in building analysis and strategy, and that's what this does. So you might be asking, um, what has Passing Gear Philanthropy done, and where has it been? And maybe it's, here it is, okay. Where, where have we worked? Here are just some examples of foundations in the South that have been touched and their strategies and goals redirected to work on the upstream causes of <laughs> downstream challenges. In 2000, Four after, well, the first one is listed here, was actually the, is not the first. The Community Foundation of Northeast Florida, 2004, the Jacksonville Community Foundation, is where this work began. When those trustees, looking at their city, where headquarters companies had vacated, said, there's a leadership void in, the, in our community. Our foundation board table is the leadership. We also have assets. Let's deploy this, not just in transactional grants, but in strategic change. The next opportunity that came was the Danville Regional Foundation, and I think Carl Stauber has probably been here. Danville, about 50 miles north of here, um, sold its public hospital. They got $250 million for it. Doesn't sound like a lot of money unless you look at the population base of 125,000. That meant they had in Danville as much philanthropic dollars per capita as the Lilly Endowment did with $7 billion in the state of Indiana. Well. So enormous opportunity, but only if it m did not engage just in simple transactional grant making. So that was our second um, passing gear engagement, and we'll see what they did with it. The John M. Belk Endowment, the Belk Stores, major um, sale of that company, um, produced a foundation that, as we'll see in a minute, is now a significant catalyst for post-secondary reform in policy and practice, a real leader in changing the post-secondary landscape in North Carolina. The Humana Foundation, which we worked with a couple of years ago, um, the foundation of that large health insurer now, through this process, has decided to take on social determinants of health and poverty in Louisville, their home community, and in the cities where they have a business presence. And finally, the Woodward Hines Foundation is basically the Belk Foundation of Mississippi, the state's largest private foundation now working to advance educational equity in that state. So these plus some others outside of the state add up to well over a billion dollars of philanthropic capital that once was, I won't say on what cruise control, that's what Jack Mara said, but at least is now deliberately focused on upstream challenges. Right. So that's a bit of the, well, the, the result. Life. And, and um, just the summary of that, um, I've, I've written up a couple of places. Danville's foundation now, that $250 million is being um, deployed to catalyze economic transformation in a former industrial city um, that was in a severe economic decline. The Belk Endowment is a thought and investment leader in 
-hmm. in education, a, a relatively new foundation yeah. in just a few years, and then Woodward Hines and Humana. So um, that's, that, that is what is possible. And it, um, I next just want to share how foundations move from where they were to become this kind of catalytic presence. And um, it's an important catalytic presence. Those numbers just in the South alone add up to about a billion dollars, which isn't the Gates Foundation, but it's a billion dollars <laughs> more than we, than we had focused here. And we hope that these places are exemplars to others of what is possible. So again, passing gear is it's really about two things. It's raising the aspirations of Southern foundations to take on deep challenges and to build their internal capacity to do that well. So I've listed this Peter Senge that likes to, I, I have rubber bands in here, but it's too dangerous to give them to you. He, he, he loves to stretch a rubber band and say, you know, it's wonderful to have aspirations. If those aren't matched with capacity, the aspirations are a fantasy. And if you have latent capacity that isn't being pulled into action by aspirations, what good is that? So this is the fundamental tension we want foundations to live in. And I love the Babcock Foundation, maybe Mary should be up here, which is really um, living and effectively working in this deep aspirations and building its capacity and community capacity to realize those. So both of those dimensions are necessary, and that's what Passing Gear works on. So I'm going to just list these things, and you're going to say, well, it sounds like everybody does this. Um, these are the elements of strategic planning, and to some degree they are. But you'll see as I unfold a little about the Passing Gear process, how there's certain ways of doing aspects of um, analysis and strategy that I think are distinctive and powerful about passing gear. So what's important to a passing gear entity? First is having anchoring values and principles that are defined um, consciously uh, in terms of advancing well-being for larger numbers. The second is to have an animating vision rooted in equity. All of MDC's work with foundations um, is designed to deal with those contradictions between values and realities for people and places who are disadvantaged. There are many other things Passing Gear Philanthropy could do, but that is the niche we feel urgently needed. The values then and the vision matter as does the mission, how can we as a small foundation make a distinctive contribution? Then comes the work of strategy to make sure it's grounded in a deep analysis, and I'm going to show you what that looks like, and um, that leads to full deployment of a foundation's assets, and then the internal capacity to make that happen. So here's an example of Danville's mission. That was a the board of the Danville Regional Foundation, when we got started, was a hospital board. It became, in less than a year, a board that embraced this vision. And today, 12 years later, is acting on it in really bold ways, to be an agent of transformation and to use its capital as that social venture capital that the South so sorely lack, lacks. And if Carl has been here, has he been a no. guest? Um, what they are doing, there's brilliant work in downtown renewal. There's brilliant work in leveraging state money to put high-speed internet into a community that was geographically isolated. Investments to reinvigorate um, the community colleges. And maybe the most amazing small is beautiful example Danville was a mill town, and if you've been in a mill town, you know a mill town culture is command and control. It is not a place that rewards entrepreneurship. In fact, it is a toe-the-line kind of community. Do what the boss said. Somebody in Danville, as part of this idea of a catalyst for transformation, had a brilliant idea. People in Danville had been socialized into taking orders from the mill. What do you do when the mill disappears and 
there's no one to give orders, sort of creates a void. So the foundation decided, we're going to make some grants. There will be no application paper. We're going to call them Make It Happen Grants. We'll award up to $5,000. Come to us with an idea of something you want to make happen, and we will fund it. It started with a few, and then these things started to proliferate. Community gardens, playgrounds, all kinds of things that over time told people they, in fact, were not dependent on the mill owner telling them what to do, that they could literally make something happen. And that sounds small, but it was a beginning of a cultural shift from dependency to mm -hmm. agency, which I think is at the basis of, of transformation. $5,000 grants, that is small can be effective. That's passing gear. So that's kind of a nice example of what can happen. So what does strategy look like? And here we're just going to walk through a couple of things. Um, and we're indebted to Susan and Joan's colleague, Craig Dykstra, at the Lilly Endowment for these two buckets. Passing gear's strategy plays out against two things. First is a reading, a truthful reading of reality, meaning how do you know what's going on and what is holding the status quo in place, and then taking action responsibly in reaction to that. Those are, those, those are the two pillars, so that the strategy rooted in analysis and in purposeful action can advance a North Star that's about equity. If you remember nothing else, and it's in this book, that's, that's how you do passing gear. So what does reading reality truthfully mean? And here we have stolen shamelessly, borrowed, appropriated with credit, the thinking of Warren Bennis, who's written a good deal about leadership. And he talks about vision having four dimensions. One is foresight. And we normally think about that. What's, what's the future going to look like? And passing gear engages people in looking at data about equity patterns. But these other ways of seeing are less frequently part of a strategy analysis. Hindsight, which is understanding how did history bring us to the point where we are. Depth perception, what's going on in imperceptible ways that we can't necessarily measure or feel but might be real. And then peripheral vision, what's coming at us if we're just looking straight forward. Passing gear engages staff and trustees in looking at all these dimensions. So what does foresight look like? MDC is, um, is, is a data-driven organization. And there's data out there, a lot of it, that reminds us and shows us that the South has enduring structural problems <coughs> that keep people marginalized. This is one piece of data from Raz Chetty, the brilliant economist and his team, looking at places in red where the chances of someone born at the bottom of the economic ladder are most constrained in terms of getting to the top. In other words, where the American dream is most um, is most uh, compromised. So when you look at, here's the test, when you look at the map, ladies and gentlemen, what part of the country is saturated in red? The South. Not just a little bit of the South, it's the whole South. What this says is, in Chetty's analysis, is stalled mobility is related to conditions in place. So if you're a place-based foundation looking at these data, the natural question is, what is it about how our place is organized that keeps our map red? And that's the beginning of, that's, that's the foresight. Right. And engaging trustees and staff in that inquiry is a powerful and important strategy, and it's also a capacity that needs to be enduring. Now comes the best part. <laughs> this is hindsight. And I, um, Kierkegaard, here we quote Kierkegaard and Faulkner. Those are an un, that's a, kind of a, like a dangerous <laughs> combo. But Kierkegaard said something very powerful. Life can only be understood backwards, 
but it must be lived forwards, which I really love. And of course, Faulkner said, the past is never dead. It's not even past, especially <laughs> in the South. So what those tell us um, is this. If we want to understand how we have arrived at where we are, we have to look at patterns and the past. So if we were all doing the timeline exercise, this wall would be a, a, um, a timeline. Across the top would be national events of significance, Civil War, Depression, Great Migration, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, Women's Movement, et cetera, et cetera. Under that would be a band generated by a community to say, what were the signal events that shaped our community's history over this same time frame? And then there would be an examination of how did our community react, respond, anticipate those national events? So it's reading community history in the context of national and international history. Um, and then debriefing that history with questions like this. How has our community historically responded to external opportunities and challenges? When have we been visionary, responsive, or reactive? These questions get a little harder. Who has benefited most from the way we do business and who's benefited least? What do these patterns tell us about our um, habitual patterns of leadership and engagement? That's really what we're trying. When faced with a challenge or an opportunity, what is our habitual response and who benefits from that? What isn't on the timeline and needs to be? And then if we were to extend this timeline into the future, what would we want to be similar or different? This is amazingly revealing. And I want to tell you one story about how revealing it is. It's a true story, just like Terry Sanford. <laughs> Joan and I were in a community. We were building the timeline. And it was a story of incredible community prosperity that then tapered off. And we started in about 1800, and we got up to 1900, 1920, 1945. National events continue, Vietnam War, civil rights. The local timeline stops in 1945. And no one names a local significant event until 25 years later. This was a rip vent. The place went to sleep for 25 years. Nothing happens between 1945 and 1970. So my wonderful co-facilitator, Joan, says, this is very curious. You know, this was a busy time in the rest of America. What was going on here? And there's dead silence. This is with the trustees and of this foundation. Dead silence. And Joan says, I don't hear anything. She's <laughs> And finally, a voice pipes up. It was a, one of the two African Americans on the, on the trustees and, and said, well, it, it wasn't such a happy time. And Joan said, why don't you tell us all the ways in which it wasn't happy? And before, here's the timeline up here. Before this man could answer, the alpha male businessman, who's now a good friend, stood up and said, I'll tell you why it wasn't happy. It was 1963. We had just passed the open, the Public Accommodations Act. Restaurants were desegregated. A black family drove into a drive-in restaurant, ordered hot dogs. The owner, who was a bigot, took frozen hot dogs, put them into a warm bun, put mustard and relish on them, wrapped them in warm foil, and sent them out to the family, who, sensing something was wrong, drove off. <laughs> And then the alpha male businessman said, and we all laughed. We all laughed. And there was a silence. This is the board table. And then he said, I'm stunned that I ever thought anything like that was funny. And then the whole 25 years of history came out. Oh, well, I guess we should put up here the time the children tried to desegregate the library and the fire hoses were turned on them. I suppose we should tell the time Martin Luther King came and snakes were thrown on, live reptiles were thrown on him and his followers. I suppose, so this whole hidden history, which was being carried by the community and for which problem solving would have been impossible had it not been made transparent, 
came alive because of this. And this is not an isolated example. So the point is this timeline, this, this looking backward, is an es especially in the South, I think, is an essential way of reading reality truthfully. Does that, it's a wonderful, it's a, now if you go back to that community, this is in Virginia, Virginia loves to mark history. What do they have now? One of those beautiful metal markers. At this site, hoses were turned on children. So now it's gone from suppressed history to public history, which means it can now be addressed. So this is, someone said, a combination of community engagement and psychotherapy. I don't know about that, but, but you, can't, you can't move to the future without excising the past, and, and, and this is part of a foundation's regimen. Last couple of things, um, depth perception and peripheral vision. Part of Passing Gear invites trustees and staff to see deeply what they don't see normally. And I love this quote from Brian Stevenson, the great civil rights um, activist. We must get proximate to suffering to understand nuanced experiences of people who experience inequality. And very often, foundation trustees aren't composed of people for whom the problems we want to solve are immediate and proximate. So there are various ways we can talk about this to get proximity, but it's essential. I think proximity, or we do, is both a plumb line for truth and guardrails to make sure we don't get off the path that deals with this. So that's reading reality truthfully. We're almost done, folks, and then you're going to finish your passing gear exam. The next stage is what do you do with that reading reality truthfully? And here, um, we're indebted to Susan Wisely. I'm so happy she's here, who with um, Elizabeth Lynn, a colleague at the Lilly Endowment, um, came up with this um, m m chart of traditions of philanthropy over time that began with the earliest expression of, of philanthropy as charitable relief of immediate need that has both strengths and limitations, evolving into um, philanthropy as improvement, thinking about Andrew Carnegie and the, the robber baron saying, the dole is bad, let us put resources behind people who have the aspiration to better themselves. And out of that comes scholarships, libraries, all sorts of things of uplift. But the problem is, teach a man to fish, or a woman, or a person. Um, what do you do if the pond is poisoned, or the pond is gated, or there are no fish in it? There are limits to that strategy. Hence emerges Philo philanthropy is social reform. The Fords, the Rockefellers, dealing with the, the structural barriers to change. Great things done, public television, um, a number of things. The danger and limit can be foundation arrogance. Where is the inclusion of people affected in the decision making? And a lot of foundations have stumbled over that. The next phase, let's engage people who are affected Wonderful, that's democracy. Engagement without action, this is the kumbaya philanthropy. We all feel good, like a wonderful Asian meal, and we leave and wonder what happened. Um, <laughs> of late, from writings as broadly as Edgar Villanueva and others, and the experience of Charleston and Charlottesville, a new tradition or need or calling of philanthropy seems to be emerging. And that's philanthropy as reconciliation, restoration, and renewal. The goal to close the divides that are pulling society apart. And the impulse, which I love from Du Bois, it is never too late to mend. And we need mending in our society. And the theory here is truth must precede reconciliation. What Susan's chart does in the passing year framework is saying, Every one of these philanthropic traditions has merit and value. Not every one of them matches the analysis we've just seen when we look. So think about this as portfolio allocation. If I have $100, and you've just seen that mobility map that's blood red, 
how would you allocate $100 across these five? If we had time, I would do this. I'd have you pair up with your neighbor, and each of you would have an allocation that was logically defensible, and you would probably not agree. And then asking, why did you, Joel, put 50 cents on philanthropy as social reform, and why did you, Marie, put 25 cents there and 50 This is a very simple way, but a powerful way of getting people, what's the thinking behind your broad philanthropic strategy, and how does that match your analysis of what is causing a problem? So this is something all the trustees go through, and it's, it's, it's fun and powerful. It's, it's thinking about an investment portfolio, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dollar portfolio. Last one. So that's what's the last ingredient in passing gear. You can see there's a lot of stuff here. Is from Jim Joseph. And uh, he helped us see that foundations have forms of capital that are not limited to their financial capital. And in fact, back to small can be effective. Very often, foundations have assets on the balance sheet beyond the relatively small assets that are financial. They have social capital. They exist in a network of relationships that they can manipulate, motivate, and work through. Moral capital, I think about, um, we're going to see an example, uh, uh, the Rosenwald Foundation saying it is immoral that black children in the South don't have decent schools. That was as powerful as the financial capital. Intellectual capital, the work of research and studies. Jerry, the work you have done to galvanize attention to issues. Reputational capital. Mary, I think about the first grant Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation made was for, I think, to address what, venereal disease in, in 1937. Wow. You know, standing for something. Um, all of these are forms of capital that are available to a foundation, and particularly for a foundation that may think it has a limited amount of financial capital, mm -hmm. this kind of thinking immediately expands their reach. So I promised Joel, I, th this is my favorite slide. So passing gear, we've actually seen it done, and the best example of passing gear philanthropy it's actually 100 years old. And how many here know Julius Rosenwald and his story? Well, I hope you all will get the movie, which I had nothing to do with, and <laughs> see the story. President of Sears Roebuck, friend of Booker T. Washington, gets inspired by the fact that black children don't have adequate school buildings in the South. So what does he do? He's one of the wealthiest men, 10 wealthiest men in America. He said, I'm not going to pay for schools. What I'm going to do is challenge low-income communities to match my dollars with their sweat equity and build schools. You might ask, in 1920 rural South, where are impoverished black communities going to get the assets to build a school? What did they do? They had bake sales. They had chicken dinners. They sold timber. They sold their cotton. They raised assets from their communities, which by any conventional notion would have been seen as undercapitalized, and put their dollars and their sweat equity to build something that they urgently needed. I love this because this is all of Susan Wisely's traditions. The Rosenwald schools met a need schools where there were no schools. It engaged in social improvement. It created opportunities for education. It engaged in social reform. One of the things Rosenwald said to the segregated school districts is, I'm going to cause these schools to be built. You won't build them, so I'm going to shame you. I'm going to build what you wouldn't do, but you have to agree to maintain these schools in perpetuity. In the segregated South, that was social reform. Mm -hmm. He practiced engagement by getting people to come together and put their assets into the pond. And this was reconciled. Br it is brilliant. Right. 1920s America. And not only was it brilliant use of all the traditions of philanthropy, you, do, we, do we all like scale? How do we take things? 5,000 
295 schools emerged from that strategy. And many of them still are in place as community centers. I mean, talk about passing gear. Talk, I mean, it's, this is amazing. Segregated South, poor communities. Anyway, we can go on. The last thing in passing year is the central role of trustees. And Paul Ilvesaka wrote another article which is so powerful when he, when he writes about the spirit of philanthropy and the soul of those who manage it. I'm not going to read all these, but he talks about the, as he said, I did Moses one better, the 11 <laughs> commandments of foundation trustees and what the guardians of the trust placed in trustees to exercise the potential of foundations, what they must remember. Um, this is why trustees are so central to a passing gear strategy as they were with the Babcock Foundation and still are. It's an incredible board of trustees as they were with Cummins Engine where Jim Joseph, Frank Thomas, Hannah Gray were all my trustees. They embodied these. So passing gear is about seeing, it's about doing, it's about holding in trust over time these virtues and putting all those to work on deep social problems. MDC is launching an institute to help build more passing gear philanthropy. It launches in January. We have four wonderful foundations and a host of wonderful R&D investors many of whom um, have been here and Joel has facilitated entree to, who are helping us spread that map. And we hope in four to five years to have 20 more Danvilles, Belks, Woodward Hines, Humanas in the South doing work in the spirit of Rosenwald to change the South. So thank you, Joel, Thank very you. Much. It's absolutely terrific. <laughs>